Online learning encompasses a spectrum of asynchronous and synchronous options. In this presentation, we'll explore various considerations for choosing either option. To start, let's look at what we know about effective teaching and learning in general. Research over many decades has helped us understand that Regardless of the learning environment, there are certain things that always have a significant positive impact on learning. We know, for instance, that student motivation is an important factor in improved learning outcomes. There are many strategies to increase motivation, but a few of the more important ones include highlighting the relevance of the content, indicating clearly where to get support when it's needed, providing timely feedback, and developing community among students and the teacher. In addition to motivation, we need to build in plenty of opportunities for interacting with the content. The research is very clear on this point. Reading and listening to lectures introduce students to the content, but they also need time and opportunity to think about, manipulate, and reflect on the knowledge and skills they're being asked to learn. When deciding when to use asynchronous or synchronous teaching and learning strategies, these things need to be kept in mind. In addition to general research on teaching and learning, we know quite a bit about online teaching and learning because we've been researching it for more than 20 years. That research has explored the relative merits of synchronous and asynchronous methods in a variety of educational contexts. In general, it suggests that synchronous and asynchronous methods offer unique affordances, but they also present specific challenges. In short, it isn't a question of if you should use asynchronous or synchronous methods. It is a question of when you should use them. Some educational outcomes can be achieved more effectively using asynchronous methods, while others are better suited to a synchronous approach. When it comes to motivational outcomes, synchronous strategies can be very useful. A live synchronous video session, for example, can really help students feel connected to the larger learning community. Additionally, you can provide more timely feedback in a synchronous environment than you can in an asynchronous one. The downside to synchronous sessions is that they are less convenient and less flexible. On the other hand, asynchronous methods are much more flexible and more convenient. This type of environment is also more supportive of the types of student content interaction, practice, and critical thinking because they allow more time to do so, more time to practice with the ideas. Yet, asynchronous environments and methods can feel quite isolating for some students, and they do require more self-discipline. Beyond the general outcomes previously mentioned, there are also specific learning objectives that need to be considered. For example, foreign language teachers frequently require students to be able to converse in the target language, while communication studies teachers often have extemporaneous speech objectives. These are two examples of things that simply can't be taught or assessed in an asynchronous environment. Other classes may have learning objectives related to convergent or divergent thinking skills. Brainstorming, for example, is a divergent thinking skill that is best addressed synchronously, at least at first. Convergent thinking, on the other hand, is best done in an asynchronous environment. These are just a few examples to demonstrate that the learning objectives must be kept in mind when deciding whether to use synchronous or asynchronous strategies.
there are also other factors to consider. Every choice we make has an ethical dimension. When it comes to technology, two big ethical concerns are privacy and access. A live synchronous session, for example, requires a decent computer with high speed internet access and a webcam. Those same sessions require a quiet, private space to engage in these kind of synchronous learning activities. Not everyone has those things, so requiring them in order to learn has definite ethical implications, as well as learning implications. Technology considerations are also important. Specifically, we need to consider whether everyone has the necessary skills to use the technology. If there is technical support available and who is providing the support. If technical support is the responsibility of faculty, then it would be more advisable to focus on using the tech they're familiar with. Otherwise, they'll have to devote more time to technical concerns, and that will mean less time available to address course content. So keep ethics and tech skills and support in mind when making your decisions about synchronous or asynchronous methods. In short, Online teaching and learning is all about finding a balance between synchronous and asynchronous methods based on student and faculty needs, learning outcomes, to, and technical and ethical considerations. There is no one size fits all approach. This presentation just covers some of the highlights of the many things you should consider when trying to decide when to use asynchronous and synchronous teaching and learning strategies. A quick review of social media outlets like Twitter or LinkedIn, articles in Educause Review or EdSearch, for example, and even a Google search of asynchronous versus synchronous learning will yield plenty of results that give you a much deeper picture. I encourage you to continue your exploration of the topic.